Hello, my name is Taylor Williamson, and I am a health systems manager at Research Triangle Institute, and I'm here to welcome you to um, an abstract driven panel on innovative tools and approaches to facilitate evidence use in policy and decision making. Uh, this session is supported by the Translating Evidence to Action th thematic working group. We're one of 10 health systems global supported thematic working groups, and we focus on the translation of health systems evidence into action through knowledge exchange on best practices, lessons learned, and practical guidance and tools. Uh, we try to decrease the gap between public health action and public health knowledge. Um, my co-chairs, Daniela Rodriguez and Nazreen Josani, are, are on Twitter helping us uh, disseminate what's happening in this panel today. Um, a quick outline of our session. Um, I'm going to do a very brief intro. Um, I've already seen all of the presentations. So I'm going to give you a couple of things to think about as you're listening to, uh, to the presentations. Um, our presentations will run about 40 to 45 minutes, and then we'll have 20, 25 minutes or so for a question and answer session at the end. Um, during the presentations, feel free to put your questions into the chat box and we'll get to them during the Q&A um, after the presentations. So today's session has speakers from across various regions and include both general and specific ideas for incorporating evidence use into policymaking. Um, from how to select indicators to how to sell implementation research to specific frameworks for thinking about how to conduct uh, assessments and what, and what data can be used to answer, to answer different research questions. These presentations should hopefully spur you to think a little bit more in depth about how to conceptualize um, different types of research and how that research influences policy. Though obviously this is, um, this is an abstract driven session. I do think that there are some common themes in the abstracts um, that got put into this session and some things to consider uh, for you while you're listening to these outstanding presentations. First, the presenters address a lot about how policymakers think about research. As you listen to the presentations, think about how policymakers can or do uh, react to indicator selection, new ways of collecting data, uh, or even the importance of research in and of itself. Second, much of the data used in these presentations already exists, um, but it's being repurposed to answer new questions and think through new challenges. As you listen to the presentations, think about maybe what existing data you can use in new ways um, and what ideas that, the, that the, these presentations have given you uh, to think about data differently. Uh, third and finally, the presentations cover the entire evidence to action process from identifying what data to collect to how to package data to how policymakers make decisions. Um, thinking about what aspects of this process are relevant to you and your context um, can help you get a lot more out of this, these, these presentations today. So without further delay, I'd like to introduce our um, the first of our five speakers. Uh, Erica Barbaza is a PhD fellow at the European, in the European Union, funded a Marie Curie training network on healthcare performance and intelligence, where her research is focused on exploring um, actionable healthcare performance indicators. Prior to starting her PhD, Erica worked for the World Health Organization at the European office in Denmark and in Kazakhstan in roles related to health systems governance, health services delivery, and primary care. So we'll turn it over to Erica. Great. Hello, my name is Erica Barbaza, and I am a research fellow and PhD candidate at the University of Amsterdam in the EU-funded program Health Pros, training a cohort of healthcare performance intelligence professionals. My presentation is on an exploratory qualitative study as part of my PhD research that set out to explore the uh, a more nuanced understanding of actionable healthcare performance indicators specifically what makes an indicator fit for purpose and use. Just to use um, the analogy of chess to illustrate our research question, in chess, each piece uh, behaves as a, as a different actor and they each have different roles and information needs. The pawn needs to know if it can effectively move forward, a bishop diagonally, and so on. Each of these moves is a decision uh, and for each piece, understanding the differences in the information needs uh, is highly relevant and that forms the basis of our study. 
So in the context of healthcare performance indicators, like in CHESS, the different actors of the healthcare system also have different information needs from the clinician improving their individual performance up to the policymaker for high, high level strategic decisions. It means there's not a one size fits all when it comes to um, healthcare performance indicators. Yet what we observed in practice is that while we've sophisticated an understanding of criteria for a valid and reliable indicator, uh, and thus statistically relevant, less attention has been put to rigorously understand what is meant by an indicator that is actionable. So we were guided by uh, two key research questions. First, what are the differences, uh, different uses of healthcare performance indicators? And secondly, what considerations influence an indicator's fitness for use? And just in terms of some key definitions, so uh, with regards to healthcare, we were broad in covering the provision of services across the continuum of care uh, and across delivery platforms from primary to acute to specialist and long-term care. And in terms of performance indicator, we're referring to a measurement tool to provide information about a dimension of quality. Now, in terms of the methods, we adopted a multi-method uh, three-phased approach to collect data uh, and analyze and uh, conduct an analysis that built upon the scientific literature, expert opinion, and user experience. We began with a search of the literature to examine the scientific evidence base and generate an initial list of fit for purpose and fit for use considerations, and also to identify leading experts in the field. And this synthesis informed uh, a provisional taxonomy for consideration in the next phase. In the second phase, we engaged prominent experts and thought leaders on performance intelligence uh, through semi-structured interviews. We conducted 16 interviews uh, in total, and these findings were thematically analyzed and informed a refinement of our working definition um, that was then put forward to the second round uh, of the user panel. So in this uh, third phase, we engaged uh, 16 users of healthcare performance indicators of varied perspectives and uses of indicators from insurers to clinicians to uh, policymakers. Uh, and these users uh, were identified through uh, international networks, working groups and projects of varied countries uh, and health system contexts. And in a similar way to the second phase, the user panels um, were engaged in semi-structured interviews and the findings uh, were thematically analyzed uh, to further refine our working definition. So in terms of our results, they're organized by our two research questions. First, on the uses of healthcare performance indicators, we identified 11 distinct and methodologically relevant uh, purposes of use of healthcare performance indicators across the health system, from improvement uh, in clinical practice at the micro level to improvement of organizations and networks at the meso level, to uh, policy uses at the macro level and the cross-cutting research feed-in function. Importantly, within these levels, the uses of performance indicators were further specified and signal the importance of clarity on the intended function uh, an indicator serves. If we take, for example, the micro level, the uses of data by, indicator, by patients to inform their choices about health professionals, treatment or care plans are distinct from uses uh, by an individual physician to improve their performance and further still from uh, physician teams to improve a practice. Now on the fitness for uh, use considerations, our multi-stage process revealed three main types. Um, methodological considerations like an indicator sensitivity uh, to change or ease of interpretation, contextual considerations like the alignment of an indicator with the existing information system and the competencies of the workforce to interpret and um, understand the, the measures, and managerial considerations that extend across an indicator's life cycle, like shown here, that signal the importance of embedding indicators into uh, managerial processes. It means Going beyond an indicator's reliability and validity from a fitness for use perspective, what constitutes a good indicator should uh, be assessed with consideration to the combined methodological, contextual, and managerial considerations for putting it into practice. So to sum up, the study has further specified the meaning of actionable um, indicators through a more refined understanding 
of indicators from a use perspective are finding signal that there are opportunities to adopt a more purposeful driven focus to our selection of indicators in order to meet the information needs of specific uh, purposes and target users. The fitness for use considerations identified offer guidance for reasoning and indicators uh, methodological alignment with their intended use, anticipating an indicator in context and also as part of a process. Now, as an exploratory study, our findings may not be generalized beyond high income countries where our experts and users were drawn from. We also didn't explore how these considerations may vary by type of health service, like um, by different types of health services, but also indicators like patient reported outcomes. The relative importance of each consideration has also not been explored. Oh, in terms of applications as a research group, uh, we've explored these findings in the current context of uh, the COVID pandemic, seeing the vast number of public web-based COVID-19 dashboards. We set out to explore whether or not these dashboards are fit for purpose and use in terms of informing uh, the public and supporting behavior change. So as a team of 17 reviewers, we've assessed 159 dashboards in use worldwide with the ultimate aim to uh, distill the common features that make these dash some dashboards more actionable than others. Now, both these studies on um, the, the use of uh, actionable indicators and our, our COVID-19 dashboard review will be published as scientific articles. Do get in touch if you're interested in a copy or a notification once they're released. Just in closing, I want to acknowledge and thank my supervisors, Dion Kringos and Professor Nick Klasinga, and here I've included as uh, some additional contact details if you'd like to get in touch. Thank you. Thank you, Erica. Our next presentation comes from Dr. Atim Mosam. She's a medical doctor with a specialist degree in public health medicine and a master's of public health and a master's of medicine. She's interested in healthcare financing and economics, as well as health promotion and prevention for non-communicable diseases. And she's currently working at Priceless South Africa. Good day, my name is Dr. Tia Mossam and I'm here to present the South African Values and Ethics for Universal Health Coverage Project, where we have developed an ethical framework for health technology assessment in the national health insurance in South Africa. Health technology assessment in theory is the systematic evaluation of properties, effects and impacts of health technologies and interventions, where health technology is a range of interventions broader than our commonly understood um, definition of technology and includes things such as vaccinations, drugs, preventative screening, as well as health promotion. It covers a range of five steps, starting with topic selection, analysis of the said topic in order to collate information um, that, is, that is useful to an appraisal committee, who then decides on whether or not to implement the intervention. In practice, however, HTA usually becomes around the decisions around new drugs which are on the market and is mostly about the economic evaluation to understand the cost effectiveness of these drugs. It really reflects local values and the context in which these decisions are made. In South Africa, there's a unique policy window now with the implementation of the NHI. The NHI legislation shows a commitment to explicit priority setting by legislating a health technology assessment agency. However, we have now seen that there is an opportunity to develop an ethical framework specifically for South Africa by a multi-stakeholder group. And this framework can be applied in an explicitly and systematic way in order to associate or augment HTA in the NHI. To do so, we undertook a proof of concept study to do two things. The first was to understand an approach to developing a framework by developing said framework. And the second was to understand how an ethical analysis using a framework would influence HTA recommendations by undertaking some real-time HTA cases. In order to develop the framework, we convened a multi-stakeholder working group, which then went through a process over a series of meetings to first begin with reviewing current literature in terms of existing ethical frameworks, legislative documents, including the NHI policy, as well as constitutional court cases where the right to health has been tested legally. They then took this literature and went through an iterative and deliberative process of voting, 
deliberation, as well as testing the framework against hypothetical cases. All of this resulted in the SAVE UAT framework that you see in front of you. The framework consists of 12 domains with related considerations and utilizes some of the relevant concepts that already are used in HTA, such as the burden of the health condition, health benefits and harms, value for money and budget impact, which take into account economic considerations, as well as system factors that may influence the implementation of such, a, of such an intervention. To augment this, we have included domains around equity, respect and dignity, impact on safety and security, impact on personal relationships, ease of suffering, social cohesion, and personal financial impact. To give you a quick example, in considering, for example, safety and security as well as personal relationships, take into account a situation where um, a contraceptive implant may be useful for women who are residing in either a patriarchal society or living in a violent relationship where this, um, where this framework might actually help augment them to be able to undertake, the, undertake their or autonomous reproductive decisions. So in order then to test the framework, we undertook simulated appraisal committees. We were meant to do five, but unfortunately due to COVID-19, we were only able to undertake three. However, these simulated appraisal committees still convened for a two-day meeting where they undertook training on the framework and then undertook two facilitated appraisals of health technologies. The first of which was varied across simulated appraisal committees for us to understand sort of a range of different interventions, but the second was standardized for us to understand whether there was any variation between committees. We then collected information via post appraisal questionnaires and focus group discussions for us to understand whether or not um, the, the perceptions of the, both the process and the framework by these appraisal committees. In terms of our strengths and limitations, we found that by keeping certain elements standard, that is the testing of the same framework, keeping a constant case across regions as well as a constant chair, we were then able to test certain elements as well as by collecting data via both individual and group feedback, we managed to have a rich amount of qualitative data. However, on the other hand, we had some limitations in terms of the number of cases we had, the variability around the simulated appraisal committees themselves, as well as the inability to complete some of the SACs. We also found that limited time for training and rapport building um, actually impeded the process to some extent, as it is envisioned that a HTA appraisal committee would actually have some time to be able to get familiar with the processes. Finally, we found that there was a challenge of in presenting comprehensive and accurate evidence, especially on domains such as, for example, the safety and security one that I mentioned earlier, where research into these areas is not as, as comprehensive. So finally, in terms of our reflections, we found that in the development of a context specific framework, which is rooted in local values, there is a lot of value in the deliberative process of identifying principles, but also in drawing upon existing policy documents and court decisions, especially in contexts where there is an explicit constitutional right to health. We find that the role of the chair in shaping discussion as well as participation and ensuring that all views and all elements are considered is critical. It is also very important to have a diverse and engaged group of stakeholders, not only for the framework development, but critically in the appraisal process, because these stakeholders bring together the, the experience and knowledge and are also able to use the experience of the health system to consider how that would influence the process of implementation. Finally, group composition in interpersonal dynamics actually critically shaped the flow of the discussion and ultimately we find the decision making. We find that the usage of case studies highlighted not only the need for a robust framework that can be applied across a different set of, of interventions, but also that when there was uh, insufficient scientific evidence, these evidence gaps actually presented sticking points for the appraisal committees and they were unable to actually proceed to a point of consensus based on these uh, evidence gaps. So finally, in terms of our next steps, we are hoping now to develop policy recommendations for how the application of the framework can be adopted for South African HTA and to engage with decision makers at various policy levels on this framework. And then also to engage with the public to assess if whether the usage of a framework and explicit decision making actually affects people's perceptions and their satisfaction 
with coverage decisions. I would like to acknowledge the Save UHC team in front of you and to thank you for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Mosem. Next, we have Dr. Asim Shahabuddin. Uh, he's working as a health specialist at the Implementation uh, Research and Delivery Science Unit at UNICEF HQ in New York. Over the past 11 years, Dr. Shahabuddin has worked as a researcher and research utilization specialist for different organizations, including the Institute of Tropical Medicine Antwerp, the, uh, the James P. Grant School of Public Health, FIGO, and FHI 360. Hello everyone, my name is Shahabuddin. I work as a health specialist at the Implementation Research and Delivery Science Unit based in uh, UNICEF headquarters in New York. On behalf of my co-authors, I'm going to present uh, this study entitled Embedded Implementation Research to Tackle Service Delivery Bottlenecks of the Immunization Program in Pakistan, Experiences and Learnings of Researchers and Implementers. Pakistan is one of the countries in, uh, in South Asia with relatively low immunization coverage. And uh, approximately half of the deaths among children under five occur due to diarrhea, pneumonia, and meningitis in Pakistan. While the evidence of the efficacy of vaccines is well established, there are gaps in terms of our understandings and knowledge related to optimal implementation and scale up of immunization programs in different settings, including Pakistan. So to keep uh, this in mind, in, uh, in 2016, Embedded Implementation Research for Immunization Program was launched in Pakistan with the support from uh, Ministry of National Health Services and uh, Federal and Provincial EPI. This initiative was supported by Gavi and technical support was provided by UNICEF and Alliance for Health Policy and System Research and WHO. Besides Pakistan Health Services Academy uh, was part of the initiative providing technical as well as uh, administrative and logistical support. Uh, in addition, uh, in-country research consultant was recruited to support the whole initiative. This diagram shows uh, the steps and key milestone, which uh, we followed in Pakistan. You can see seven steps. And the first steps, uh, a steering committee was formed, researcher was uh, recruited, and also in-country technical support center was engaged, which was Health Services Academy in Pakistan. After the research prioritization was done, and it was done through literature review and also uh, a research prioritization workshop was organized in Islamabad with EPI, uh, EPI manager and policymakers. So after prioritization, a call for proposal was launched based on the priority research questions or based on the identified questions. And then uh, one, of the, one of the key criteria to apply for this call, of, call for proposal was that an EPI manager or policymaker should be uh, should be the principal investigator or, or co-principal investigator and should team up with local research institute. So after selection of 10 uh, research projects out of 27, you organized protocol development workshop and then data collection, data analysis was done. Then, uh, then a translation and dissemination workshop was organized in Islamabad. So key objective of this study was to explore challenges, success, and, and lesson learned in order to inform future embedded uh, implementation research initiative. And to do that, we conducted an online survey among the members of the research teams. And we have also done uh, several in-depth interview with additional members of the uh, research teams, as well as uh, officials from UNICEF and Alliance for Health Policy and System Research also from the government. A thematic analysis was done to analyze and present the data. In terms of key successes, three points were highlighted by the participants. First thing they mentioned about the effective engagement of EPI manager and policymakers in, in research project. And EPI managers, they have highlighted that this is the first time they 
who are collaborating with researchers and we know about uh, the long-standing concern or gaps between researcher and policymakers but this is the first time they have mentioned that in Pakistan they were working in collaboration with researchers working uh, towards the uh, towards uh, exploring uh, challenges of uh, solutions and generation of comprehensive evidence within short period of time with relatively small amount of money, uh, amount of money was highlighted as as uh, as a key success and the total time period uh, was for each of the pro each of the research project was one year and twenty thousand dollar was provided to do the research and all the teams are able to manage that there has been large appetite and appreciation of this work when uh, we launched the call for proposal, we have received, received 27 applications and out of that, 10 were selected. So there are several factors which really facilitated to reach those successes. And the first thing uh, mentioned by the uh, participants that strong government buy-in was crucial because at the beginning of this uh, initiative, Ministry of National Health Services, uh, Federal and Provincial EPI was part of the initiated, initiative and they were very much supportive. And active engagement and leadership of the EPI managers was, uh, was a key uh, to reach uh, the successes because as I mentioned that uh, EPI implementers uh, was acting as a principal investigator or co-principal investigators. So they, they felt like they are owning this project, which really helped. And then continuous support was provided by the local consultant researcher and also uh, colleagues from uh, UNICEF uh, country office and uh, from Alliance for Health Policy and System Research, which really helped. In terms of challenges, they have mentioned about several challenges. And the first one, they highlighted about the lack of clarity on the roles and responsibility of each partner involved because there are several partners who are involved in this uh, initiative and they have suggested uh, is, is, uh, uh, is they have suggested to clarify the role and uh, responsibility of, of, of each partner at the outset of uh, this kind of initiative and they have also mentioned about uh, the limited expertise they had uh, regarding implementation research and a couple of them mentioned about that they didn't understand uh, the concept or approach of implementation research or in-country research consultant had to work with them closely and insufficient follow-up to ensure the uptake of research findings was also highlighted by them as uh, one of the challenges and then they have uh, also highlighted limited dissemination uh, of the findings to policymakers especially at the district and provincial levels because pakistan was uh, decentralized country and they have uh, highlighted uh, the importance uh, to share the findings uh, at the district and provincial levels which was not done um, effectively in Pakistan. So that's the end of my presentation. Thanks very much for uh, listening. Thank you Dr. Shahabuddin. Next we have Dr. Addo uh, Rivera. He is a PhD candidate in health services and outcomes research at Northwestern University, and he uses real world data to investigate heart health among people living with HIV and the impact of health policies on patient outcomes. Hello, I'm Ado Rivera presenting my project leveraging death registration data for planning and evaluation of health system policies and programs and applications to the Philippine setting. Evidence-based public health requires smart use of data to guide the process, especially in terms of prioritization and evaluation. Primary research for planning can be difficult to implement in low and middle income country settings because resources are much more limited. Fortunately, digital health data is now more common. And we have already several examples of these studies, including the Global Burden of Disease study that used digital health data for research and planning. Inspired by these studies, I present the use of digital health data, specifically death registration data, for planning and evaluation in the Philippine context. I use this general framework uh, when conducting my project. Um, I started with specifying the problem, then followed by assessing the data sources, cleaning and analysis, and then presentation of findings. In the Philippines, health data generally comes from these four sources, vital and death registration, demographic and health surveys, field health surveillance information system, 
and the national health insurance claims. In this presentation, I focus on death registration because in my experience, death registration data has been underutilized in public health planning and research. In addition, when examining mortality statistics, it's the best data source that we have because it's, and it's available annually and it, has, um, it allows the ability to do high resolution spatial and temporal analyses. Unlike the DHS, uh, where it's just available every three to five years, um, and the FHSIS is, um, has some data quality issues. Death registration in the Philippines is mandatory and is digital since 2005, including ICD-10 codes. Uh, while the coverage is quite high at 80 to 90 percent, there is, um, we aren't sure about the degree of local variation in terms of geography, um, and as well as if there's underreporting by calls. My results are split into two. Um, one is in relation to planning, um, and the next one is to correlation. Looking at death registration for planning, I started um, by examining the recent law. In 2009, the Philippines passed a universal health care law and moved the management of public health from municipalities back to provinces in order to develop province-wide health systems. It should then help these provinces identify priority health problems. Now, um, prioritization would require, of course, looking at all the data sources um, to examine mortality, morbidity, and health services. But if we want to focus on mortality, as I've said before, death registration is the best data source because of the data quality um, and the um, resolution that's available for us. When using death data for planning, um, usually provinces will just calculate mortality rates and then report the top causes of death. Um, I argue that conducting hotspot analysis would be useful as well, since it's, it can help identify diseases that are unusually high in the province. Hotspot analysis would start by inspecting the thematic or chloropleth maps, followed by formal testing to see if the um, highlighted areas are statistically significant using local Moran's I or Gettys or GI star. Uh, I run these analyses using open source and free software called Geoda. The example of the results will be shown in the slide here. To the left, we see a thematic map where we see which provinces have higher rates of mortality for diabetes in darker shade of orange. And to the right, we see hotspots in red showing which areas have significantly higher deaths after accounting for spatial variation. Usually for hotspot analysis, we repeat it with another method um, to assess robustness. And we see here that it, um, the hotspot analysis in both um, methods um, kind of agree with each other. Now applying it to a province, um, I select Bohol, uh, island in central Philippines, and identify the top cause of death in that province. And then for each cause of death, I ran hotspot analysis to identify if the province is a hotspot for each cause of death. While in the top five, um, the province is indeed a hotspot for some of the top five causes of death. We also see that in the lower rank, um, some lower rank diseases are also, um, the province is also a hotspot for some of the lower rank diseases, such as hypertension and respiratory tuberculosis. Another way to apply this is to uh, look at diseases of national interest and perform hotspot analysis and, ident and check if the province of interest, in our case Bohol, is a hotspot for that disease. And in this case, we see that Bohol is a hotspot for viral hepatitis, but not malnutrition or HIV AIDS. In addition, we see that surrounding provinces are also hotspots for the disease, suggesting that a regional approach could be considered um, when addressing this issue. Now we move on to death registration for evaluation. I evaluate um, the program Doctors to the Barrios. It's a non-randomized deployment of doctors to doctorless areas um, in order for doctors to provide clinical services and leadership for public health teams um, in order to improve health outcomes. However, there has been no robust evaluation on health um, outcomes, um, impact of the program on health outcomes. Folks, um, since this is a municipality level program, I need data that has high spatial resolution. And it's only these two data sources that can offer that. However, because of data quality issues, um, especially in terms of mortality, I opt to use death registration. To assess the association of the program to mortality, um, I modeled deaths for each municipality over time um, and assessed this association um, for, measured by beta one. And if this association changes over time, measured by beta three. 
I ran a negative binomial model and implemented this using open uh, source software R. Examining the box plots, we see that DTTB sites on average have lower mortality than compared to non-DTTB sites. Um, as well, and DTTB sites also have slightly lower mortality over time compared to non-DTTB sites. Running the model, we confirmed this, that uh, there is indeed a significantly lower risk for mortality in DTTB sites. However, this asso uh, significant association wanes over time. In summary, we see uh, demonstrated death registration data can be used for planning and evaluation in public health. A spot analysis complements usual ranking methods, um, and the advantage for these data is that we can use maximal sample sizes for evaluations. I also showed that we can use free and open source software for the analysis. We should be wary of some pitfalls, however. Um, first of all, we shouldn't make decisions based on just one analysis or just using one data source. And we shouldn't make decisions without consulting local stakeholders. We should also be cognizant when interpreting findings about data quality issues, such as underreporting of deaths or unaddressed confounding um, that could influence um, the significant results. In the future, I hope to work with the Department of Health to further refine the analysis and interpret the results, as well as perform some high resolution mapping for certain diseases. I would like to thank these agencies for all their support in this analysis, and I look forward to answering your questions. Thank you. Thank you, Addo. Next, we'll hear from uh, Sarah Salzbach. She's a public health specialist with 20 years of experience managing, implementing, analyzing, and evaluating health programs and policies in the U.S. and low resource settings. She's also dedicated to improving the lives of vulnerable populations through increased access to health information, preventative care, and life-saving treatment. Sarah. Hello. My name is Sarah Salzbach, and I'm a senior research advisor with the USAID Health Research Program. I'm pleased to share some of the work our program has been doing to support adaptive learning approaches in low and middle income countries, and specifically how we are developing materials to support country level use of implementation research among non researchers. In 2014, at the third global symposium on health systems research in Cape Town, a coalition of partners, including USAID, the World Bank, UNICEF, the Alliance for Health Policy and Systems Research, and the Dorstuk Foundation issued a statement calling for the need for partnerships between policymakers, program managers, and researchers to address the challenges of equitable implementation, sustainable programs, and scale-up through wider use of implementation research. While interest, opportunities, and resources related to implementation research have grown since then, much of the existing guidance available on implementation research is still focused on methods and analysis and geared towards researchers. When the coalition reconvened at the 2018 symposium in Liverpool, we agreed that clear guidance on how and when to conduct IR could reduce the missed opportunities for utilizing this approach, and we began discussing the development of a flexible guide to encourage the use of implementation research by local health decision makers. USAID's um, health research program has supported this effort, starting with convening global and national partners, developing interview guides, and conducting stakeholder interviews designed to inform the development of the IR guide. Over the next few minutes, I'll share some of the main findings from these interviews and how we're using this information to develop materials to support the needs of policymakers and program managers in addressing implementation challenges. Data collection included 33 semi-structured interviews with national program managers, technical specialists, researchers, and health policymakers, the majority representing countries in Africa. The initial informants were recommended by coalition members. We then used purposive snowball and opportunistic sampling to identify additional informants. The interview guide was developed iteratively, iteratively over the period of data collection and explored the range of topics summarized here under the modular guide section. Um, so in terms of results, based on these interviews, informant experiences with implementation research varied, but most often involve research embedded in field trials or pilot initiatives that were seeking to develop effective implementation strategies to inform scale up 
with a real emphasis on understanding and addressing implementation challenges. We also learned that most IR efforts, um, at least among the informants we interviewed, were donor driven and donor funded. Governments are interested in research and evidence, and most want to see the evidence from other countries replicated in their own countries. There is, however, some resistance to funding implementation research among governments and donors alike. One respondent explained that spending money on research over implementation is questioned when evidence of what works is already known. This highlights the need for better understanding of and advocacy for implementation research, emphasizing that it can be used to understand how and why implementation of evidence-based interventions is or is not working. It also underscores the need for more information on the cost effectiveness of implementation research approaches. Respondents were clear that the information included in the materials being developed needed to be brief, visual, full of real life examples, and broadly applicable. More than narratives or descriptions, they wanted tools, templates to guide them through the different elements of implementation research, and they suggested that we use and link to existing resources. Taking this feedback into consideration, the team settled on a series of briefs called 10 Tips for Implementation Research. The tips are designed to lay out the most important implementation research concepts, appeal to health decision makers, adapt to a variety of country contexts, audiences, and health interventions, use practical and concise language, and facilitate access to key resources. My next slides demonstrate how we've incorporated these recommendations to inform the content and the structure of the tips. For instance, the first two tips are focused on introducing implementation research, describing how it works, and building the case for its use. The third tip offers guidance on how to decide when implementation research is the most appropriate strategy and distinguishes um, implementation research from other efforts such as monitoring and evaluation and includes how implementation research can be used to influence policy. Importantly, a key recommendation emerging from the interviews was that any approach to conducting implementation research must be accompanied by guidance on identifying implementation problems. One respondent's comment summed up a theme echoed by many, um, noting that the first support that we need is to know what the problem is before we learn how to conduct implementation research. This topic is addressed in tip number four. Meaningful stakeholder engagement is one of the critical elements to successful implementation research. Respondents identified the Ministry of Health, academia, program implementers, donors, and beneficiaries as the most salient stakeholders and expressed interest in tools to facilitate bringing these stakeholders together as a means of building support for implementation research and the uptake of its findings. Specifically, this included identification, engagement, role definition, and coordination of various stakeholders. As a result, tip number five offers strategies for collaboration that ensure engagement is meaningful throughout the process. Another critical message emerging from the interviews was the need for help in formulating research questions to best support program design, improve delivery, and implementation scale-up. We dedicated tips six and seven to themes around developing a theory of change or framework to guide implementation research, including developing the research questions. Currently under development, tips eight through 10 include a brief overview of research methods and ethical considerations, guidance on process documentation, and strategies for utilizing and sharing implementation research learning. In terms of next steps, we welcome input from potential users in terms of how the tips might be enhanced, improved, or adapted. You can access the tips through our Health Research Program website with the link shown here. I encourage you to review these tips and provide feedback, as well as suggestions on additional resources. While we hope these tips serve, will serve as useful guides, 
We also recognize the need for continued advocacy and capacity building in implementation research. USAID is committed to continuing to support this important area and to working with global and national partners to advance implementation research and other adaptive learning approaches. I want to take a moment to thank you all for joining today and to thank the team behind this effort, starting with the CIRCLE project. Um, specifically, Robert McPherson, who led the data collection and analysis, and Monica Fox, Ellen Roskamp, and Ilona Barlier, who incorporated those findings into the TIPS briefs. Thanks also to members of the coalition who supported this effort, uh, including my colleagues at USAID, and to all of our stakeholder informants. These IRR tips are just one example of how USAID's health research program is supporting an implementation research approach involving strong stakeholder engagement to improve maternal, newborn, and child health outcomes. You can learn about some of our other research efforts on our website following the links provided here. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Now it's time to turn it over to the Q&A. Um, if I could ask our panelists to turn their videos on. Thank you. Um, so unfortunately, we only have three of our five presenters here with us. So if you have questions uh, for Sarah or for uh, Dr. Shah. Sorry, I was on mute. Um, <laughs> thank you, Sarah, for that presentation. Um, we really appreciate it. Um, unfortunately, we uh, only have three of our five presenters here with us today. Um, so if you have questions for the other two presenters, uh, Sarah or Dr. Shahabuddin, um, those questions, we can figure out a way to send them to them later and maybe we can figure out how they can get in touch with you. We have their email addresses and can figure that out. Um, so I'm gonna start off our Q&A with the first question in the chat for uh, Addo. It is, um, what would it take for the country uh, or even individual provinces to adopt this approach of using death registration to inform health system planning and evaluation on a regular basis? Some of these analyses may be beyond the skills of regular health managers. Can these be automated? What norms and behaviors need to be modified? Adam? Uh, yeah, that's a really nice question. And I, when I was working on this project, I was thinking about how to, how can this uh, very research-oriented um, analysis that I did can be translated to a routine process. One of the things that I think should be fixed first is the access to the data. I had a very hard time accessing the data that I use in this analysis. Um, so that's the first step into in, um, introducing it into the routine. Um, the other one is they mentioned it in their question is to actually build up the capacity of uh, people within um, the national or local government to actually run these analyses. And the models that I use are not that, um, they're not the most advanced or like um, newest models. They've been there for quite some time. So, it's something that they, um, it's something that can be taught and learned by um, staff, maybe at the national level. Um, and they did mention that about automation or um, yes, it can be done. Um, like the code can be repeatedly run a few years. You still need a person to be monitoring and checking the code. And, and you still need a, the important part is to have a team of people actually dedicated to reviewing the model outputs and seeing if it all makes sense, um, contextualizing it and applying it to the real, um, to any questions that they have want answered by the models and analyses. Um, and I do want to highlight that all the approaches that I did for this analysis use open source data. I use R, uh, open use software. I use R for a lot of the analyses and Geoda, which was developed by people at the University of Chicago. Um, and it can be downloaded and they have like, easy to understand instructions on how to conduct these analyses. Great, thank you. 
Um, we have one other question uh, for Addo, which is um, Mary Ruth Politico wants to know what the year of analysis uh, was when applied to the context of the DTTBP, and would it be possible to get a copy of the study or the paper? Yes, um, don't have the exact numbers, but I think it's up to 2016. Um, and now it's up to 2016 um, before the pandemic happened. Um, and yes, I can, um, I will contact, because I know, I think, um, Dr. Politico is part of the Department of Health in the Philippines. Uh, I'll be very happy to contact them uh, after this conference. Okay, that makes a lot of sense. Um, so I don't see any other questions on the Q&A right now, but um, as I was listening to your presentation, Erica, you know, I was, you had mentioned the COVID dashboard sort of like at the very end that you were doing a study of the, I think it was 159, dashboards. And I was curious what you found when you were reviewing those dashboards, if there's any information from that yet, since, you know, you recorded the presentation probably a little while ago. So. Yeah, thanks. Yes, uh, we've made some progress on that project. So um, back in the, the spring period, we did a review of uh, a global sample of COVID-19 dashboards, as I uh, mentioned, 158 in total from 53 different countries. And in that review, we were trying to explore um, in a comparative way, what is being reported on the dashboards and how they're analyzing and displaying that. And we took a lot of lessons and that, um, that study is uh, available as a preprint with JMIR at the moment. Uh, and some of the key highlights there were, uh, we tried to summarize common features of highly actionable dashboards. So what the expert panel found to be more useful for decision-making. Uh, and things, uh, so for example, the reporting of data sources, which sounds as an obvious and intuitive uh, feature of a dashboard was actually quite infrequent and uh, concerning that we're missing really obvious and uh, well-evidenced um, communication tools uh, that are important for users to, to find information trustworthy and to be able to use it in their decision-making. Uh, so we tried to summarize these as seven key features uh, for improving the actionability of dashboards. And that spans from everything from Im improving how we communicate uh, the data sources and what's being measured um, to, to ways to uh, improve how we um, interpret and narrate what is on the graphs. Uh, very often we found that this was infrequently used when it's again a known and uh, well-proven tool for, for communicating. So great lessons and we're, we're now doing some um, follow-up work on a subset of the dashboards to see how they've changed, uh, recognizing that the content on COVID dashboards should evolve and change with the course of the pandemic. So we need different information at different moments. Um, so we're trying to gauge to what extent they're responding to that change. Uh, and further to that, also trying to, um, uh, in a separate study, reach the developers of the dashboards to get their lessons that they've learned um, from the early stages of launching these often in the span of a few hours to go on to have uh, a number of millions of users uh, or viewers per day. So hopefully some um, good lessons there as well. So we don't start from scratch in another moment. Thanks. Yeah. So when you say you're looking at like different types of information, are you talking about like moving from collecting lots of testing data to now that we have a vaccines, thinking a little bit more about vaccination, that kind of stuff, or is there something else to that? Exactly. Yeah, no, exactly that. So how, how do we shift um, the dashboards as we move through the pandemic uh, and take advantage of uh, perhaps new types of information that is available or new information like the vaccination that we see now coming up on the dashboards, um, as well as sophisticating them beyond just the uh, immediate access to higher level data, but to make that data more granular and to uh, ensure that it's contextualized. So with relevant breakdowns for the population, which is also something that has really improved over the, the course of the pandemic. Uh, and an interesting sort of trend as we've moved further is there's now really a swelling of information. So we have less of a shortage but to use a, a dashboard effectively, it should really continue to be an at a glance summary of the, the information. So it really challenges us to be more strategic in the content that's being put forward for the public to consume rather than being dizzied by uh, the amount of data that's, that's there and often more confusing than, um, than useful. Great. 
Thanks for that clarification. Interesting. Uh, Dr. Mosem, I uh, got a question for you about uh, this, the stakeholder focus groups. So like, <clears throat> one of the things that you mentioned was that there were interesting group dynamics within those, within those groups um, and that they shaped a lot of the discussions and the decisions. And I'm kind of curious if you could expand upon that a little bit more. I found that interesting in your presentation. Sure. Um, the range of stakeholders that we had were people from, you know, academia, civil society, uh, people working within the services, and then government officials as well. So you can imagine the, the viewpoints that people, people would have. And by virtue of, I think, the roles people came with and, you know, thinking within their framework, it did in some ways cause a lot of tension in the decision-making process. And, you know, considering this was a, was a deliberative process where it was more around uh, discussing and arguing per se, and not so much scoring something according to a framework, it was very difficult so to, for us even as researchers to predict where they were going to. So for example, in one of the um, cases that they had done, we, uh, you know, from the discussion, we thought, oh, they're all converging towards one, uh, you know, option. And when it came down to it and we said, okay, so what, what was your recommendation? They had completely different, uh, a completely different recommendation. So I think these, these different viewpoints and different, um, not agendas, but the sort of different stakes that it is for different uh, of different stakeholders does feed into it where civil society might have a diff completely different view uh, to someone who is working in the services or someone who is in charge of actually ensuring that the services are delivered. And, and in terms of influencing how decisions were actually made, like how did those sort of like different perspectives influence the way policymakers, you know, considered, um, you know, the findings? That's a really important point because one of the key findings or one of the key things that kept um, being mentioned was the role of different um, stakeholders and the concept that people with louder voices or people who are deemed to be more knowledgeable um, might have more power. So, you know, in South Africa, there is a lot of um, focus on civil society engagement. And so we, you know, having an inclusive process means that you have people who might not be, um, you know, have studied formally, for example, and there is a worry that those voices would get lost because they would not be able to, or would not feel confident enough uh, in a room full of specialists or academics or even in a room full of government officials. So, you know, uh, there's a lot of thought now on our end on how do you engage with all of these different voices so that you do ensure that there is not just representation for the sake of representation, but that there is participation and active participation and that policy um, decision makers ensure that they've taken that range of voices into consideration. Thanks. I think that's a really important consideration is thinking about sort of those civil society strengthening and engagement platforms. Um, Addo, there's, there's a question for you in the Q&A, um, and I'm curious, or Nazreen is curious, um, how has the government responded to the misalignment at times between hotspots and priorities, and how have other researchers responded to using hotspotting as a research methodology? Um, so for the analysis that I have, I, one thing I haven't done is I haven't fed bad results yet to the Philippines. Um, so I don't know how they'll react. I think there are a few people um, watching that are part of the DOH that they could chime in in the chat. Uh, um, but from what I understand from when I was working back at home, um, we didn't use hotspotting in the prioritization. When we look at um, planning documents, we don't use hotspotting yet. We, I, uh, that's why I showed in the slide, I showed South morbidities and mortalities per province. Um, but I pointed out that we haven't really looked at the angle of uh, using hotspots within localities to maybe fine tune our priorities. Um, and to the second question of, um, sorry, what was the latter part of the question? 
Yeah, how have uh, researchers, other researchers responded to using hotspotting as a research methodology? Um, I can't say, uh, I, can't, I can't speak for other researchers, but from, <laughs> but from what I think it's a very important tool um, to identifying, um, especially if you're working in a context with limited um, resources. Um, I think hotspotting is a very important tool for use. It should not be the only thing that um, you use when you're prioritizing, um, but I think it's a very important one. Yeah, so Ado, have you seen interest in these methods from the wider research community? Um, you know, that might be one way of thinking about like how much, you know, other researchers are thinking about the hotspotting yeah, technique. Yeah, um, when I was uh, reading more in the literature, but there's a lot more um, papers coming up with these hotspots. Um, I think it was a, kind of a reaction to this, because um, uh, the Global Burden of Disease study um, a lot of, a lot of, um, maybe a kind of a reaction to it. Um, the GBT has been driving the conversation for your decision a lot, um, but there's a lot of new research groups that they're deriving their own local estimates or localized estimates um, kind of independent to the GBT. So you see more of these local, borrowing from the GBT lab, which they have these local bird of disease studies, but they, um, but these, um, Country, different countries have, are generating their own local estimates um, outside of the framework of what GPT does. Interesting. Okay. Thanks. Um, so I've got, um, I'm going to come back around a little bit because um, I've got another question for Erica that's not in the chat. Um, you know, one of the things that, you know, I and my work have faced when thinking about indicator selection is like the data that is available in order to like actually, you know, have a, have a, to meaningful, re meaningfully report back on that indicator. Um, you know, and it seemed like your work really focused on that like selection piece. So I'm curious, like how much the availability of data actually informed the selection of indicators that you did. Yeah, thanks for that question. Uh, it was, well, exactly that in terms of trying to find a combination between selecting an indicator that is the desired uh, measure of interest and coupling that with the reality of um, do we have the, the data and is this something feasible that we can be collecting? So trying to find the whole spectrum of, uh, and we go into more detail on that in the paper itself um, with the, the message that, well, first, we should not be entirely uh, data driven in terms of our selection so that we're um, focused exclusively on where we have the data available. So we're, um, it's, be, it's being dictated by that, but rather trying to begin that process of selection with what is the, what is the aim or purpose of the decision that we're trying to make and then problem solving from there in terms of, well, do we have the data? Unfortunately not, or what would be another source of data um, that we could use to accommodate based on the, the information need and the decision that's being made. So re really making that the starting point and then considering from there the other um, reality checks of the the real world situation in terms of how the uh, indicator would be used and in our study we, we tried to map all of those moments because very often uh, once that indicator is selected and it's sourced the conversation ends there but what um, we found through our discussion with the the experts and the data users was really all those moments along the way in terms of thinking about the analysis and what should that look like so it meets the need of the decision maker in terms of how it's being displayed and delivered, what, what will ease that uh, decision making process. So we tried to extend from just the selection process of the indicator to really think through each of these checkpoints um, around the indicator's uh, life cycle but, uh, to, to bring those together so that um, it's really a, a thoughtful process and that we reason each uh, element, be it the lack of the data, which is very often the, the main hurdle, but ultimately to how do we reach the people we want uh, with the information that we have. So really starting with that focus on the need and then identifying sort of like what the checkpoints were beyond that. So like really yeah. focusing there first and then identifying other sort of pieces beyond that that may influence how that indicator is yeah. used. Huh. Exactly. And the, the piece around the information need 
um, while intuitive, we uh, we use indicators in different ways. Of course, uh, the 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 challenge to really think through what is the use and who is the uh, the end user of the indicator was something that we found well really interesting to disentangle, but. Um, very often not the starting point of that conversation. And it carries over into the work we've been doing with COVID to understand who are we trying to reach, what indicator will speak to them or be useful for that decision-making. So um, that purpose of use was really the starting point and then the fitness for use being the, the further consideration. Great, thank you. Um, I see uh, Dr. Shahabuddin has joined us. Great, we have a question for you in the chat based on your presentation. So if you're if you're all set up, um, the the question for you um, is whether or not we can take the study that you did in Pakistan and how that might apply um, to to Bangladesh. If there are like contextual considerations that might be of that might be of interest. Sure. Uh, thanks very much, Taylor. And uh, my apology that I was a bit late in joining the call. Uh, somehow I, I think I misunderstood about the timing. So uh, in terms of the questions, I think it's, it's really good questions. The work we have done in Pakistan, as you have seen in my presentation, that three key elements which we have uh, found in Pakistan, which could be, I think, applicable in, in, in most of the settings in South Asia. Uh, three things. Uh, which really played important role in terms of uh, translating evidence into actions and making research relevant to programs. First thing was that we had strong government support when we started the initiative, uh, implementation research uh, for immunization program. The request actually came from the government. They reached out us to uh, uh, asking whether we could do some kind of research which could really influence the policy or which could be useful for programmatic decisions. The first thing, the government was part of the initiative since the beginning. Secondly, as, uh, as in my presentation, I have uh, shared that the research was done in collaboration with in-country researchers together with implementers themselves. So they really, enjoyed both researchers and policymakers. They really enjoyed working with each other because this is the first time most of the policymakers, they said that they work together and they really complemented each other in terms of knowledge that they had about problems and the potential solutions about the systems and so on, which really helped to identify the real time problems as well as solutions. And then lessons we had in Pakistan can be can could be can be applicable in in many settings in most of the countries in South Asia, as I said. And that is, I think, uh, what we we can test it. I know that there are a lot of institutions and even organizations they are uh, working on imp embedded implementation research, and they have uh, come up with a uh, lot of success and good stories about uh, informing policies and making uh, real-time changes uh, on the ground. Yeah. Over to you, Taylor. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Dr. Shahabuddin. So I'd like to open it up for the last five minutes to see if our panelists have questions for each other or if there, if there were things about um, specific presentations that you had further questions about or you were interested in. Um, I don't know. Who'd like to go first? Dr. Mosum. Thank you. I just wanted to say, I was just, um, uh, you know, Erica's presentation intrigued me because I'm quite glad that someone is looking at the dashboards. I think we all started using dashboards. It became a, quite a, um, a, a tool that was used quite widely, even by, as you said, the the public because it was uh, easy access to information and so I just I just want to say I'm quite it's it's quite um, heartening to know that you're looking at the 
you know, we, what we report and, you know, is it fit for purpose? Because I do know that a lot of um, companies, a lot of individuals in their personal capacities were making decisions based on these dashboards, you know, trying to predict what the pandemic would be doing and whether they should start having in-person meetings or trainings and the like. So I think this is a really important um, piece of information. It would be really nice to see how it evolves and so that, you know, the decision-making is, is clearer. Um, people can, you even the public can utilize it um, for the sort of personal, obviously within limits, but with, for their own personal benefit and decision-making. Just to react to that, and, uh, and thanks for, for um, yeah, for the encouragement and that it's of course always reassuring when uh, to hear that your research is, is of interest to others. And uh, I think this, or we've taken from the, the investigation um, or the work we've done so far is the, the fact that what it's a, such a unique moment where we're monitoring this pandemic real time and have uh, endless amounts and access to data. Um, but the biggest challenge has been really using the, the knowledge and uh, evidence we have of how to communicate effectively. Uh, meeting the, um, the crossroads of those two has been the, the greatest challenge. So definitely lots can be learned for improving how we effectively do that in other moments. And as I said, our, our study of how they've changed over time also signals that we are making improvements of the dashboards, but um, some definitely rely on uh, epidemiological understanding to be able to make sense of uh, what they're signaling. So there's still a lot of um, good improvements that can still be made and hopefully we can continue to see that happen. And I think uh, just to, to jump in with the reflection for the other speakers, I think it's been really interesting to see the link that we all have to trying to bring together different um, stakeholders and have conversations that speak to different audiences. That's very much the focus of uh, my research and I, I see that as a common thread for each of our work. So it's been really interesting to, to see that commonality. Thanks. Thanks. Addo, do you have any reflections on the other presentations? Yeah, um, I think it was Dr. Shahabudi who mentioned one of their challenges was um, <clears throat> about conceptual frameworks and um, fear of change um, you know, in conducting their research. I realized a lot of IR and IS has been developed in like US or high income settings. And I wanted to hear his opinions on how their group that they created um, faced address this challenge of adapting or creating their own frameworks. Hi, thanks, uh, Edu, for, for your question. So the way like we have, we have been applying implementation research uh, within UNICEF, uh, in, in, in several projects, we we used uh, uh, we 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 have come up our with our own approaches. Like uh, um, there were several steps that we follow, starting from uh, developing research questions, which uh, is done actually in collaboration with the implementers through workshop or through uh, uh, through uh, discussion. And then we start with developing research protocol and then uh, research methodology and actual collection of the data. And then uh, important part, part is about research utilization. But in terms of framework, I'm not sure whether I have uh, mentioned that uh, in, in my presentation in, in Pakistan, the work we did actually uh, we, we followed the steps that we have developed uh, through our own experience at eight steps, starting uh, from uh, building research questions and research objects. But Doc, in, Dr. Uh, Shahubuddin, we're, we're at the end yeah. of 
time. So thank you for that response. I want to thank all of our presenters for their time and for their amazing presentations today. I thought this was a wonderful session. And I think, you know, the commonalities that I noted at the top and that Erica noted at the noted recently were also quite good. So and thank you very much for attending. I, I really appreciate it. Take care.